Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by my wonderful co-host, Ricardo Martinez. Uh, and today we are interviewing uh, Bill McDonald, a Bitcoiner, a meetup organizer of Bay Area Bitcoin. And so I'm told by my colleague, Thomas, an all-round stand-up guy. How are you doing today, Bill? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, I think Thomas is, is, is probably lying to you. Last time uh, we were together, I may have been overserved at the bar and, and was unable to catch up with him the following day because I had to stay in bed. But it's nice that he thinks I'm a stand up guy. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, you just, you know, the, the bar staff might have paid a trick on you or something. Is you know, it's definitely not your fault. Um, nothing on your character. Yeah. I mean, I was just trying to, I thought I was ordering waters. Honest mistake. I, mean, I can completely understand. <laughs> But yeah, it's um, but yeah, it's great to, to have you on, and um, I'll, I'll I'll get a question to get us going. Um, obviously, as I said in the intro, uh, you're um, uh, organizer of, of the Barrier Bitcoin meetups. Um, when did you start getting involved in the Bitcoin or crypto uh, meetup scene? That's a fair question. In 2015, I kind of first got into Bitcoin, and when I say got into, I mean heard that a thing called Bitcoin existed. Had you asked me to explain it, it would have been the worst and most inaccurate uh, description of Bitcoin you've ever heard. Um, around that time, Coinbase was sort of one of the only things that I knew about, you know, that was had a UX that was usable. Um, right around that same time, 2016 into 2017, uh, found my way, you know, trading some Bitcoin for Ethereum and then landing on Poloniex. And all of a sudden my Ethereum is becoming every shit coin that went to zero. I'm the worst gambler ever. It was, I mean, Gollum, uh, Oyster Pearl, Shellcoin, Dragon Chain, Array. Um, I mean, not, not one of them. Uh, on the beach one day, I definitely sent money to something called iDice, uh, which... <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it was just a pure scam. They just, they let you send money to them. And then that was the end of it. Um, but in 2017, I started hosting Crypto Monday events in San Francisco. Um, so I think that's when I got into the meetup scene in general. Uh, but, but since then I have, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm maximal-ish, right? I'm going to tend towards Bitcoin, but I don't have any hatred towards someone out there defying to the, you know, to the, to the cows come home. Uh, in general though, now um, I just do the Bitcoin meetups uh, in San Francisco. I gotcha. I am. Um, I, I think I would agree that I, I'd say I'm like more. Yeah. I always say I'm like a bit fo Bitcoin focused guy. Like, you know, I'm not too, but I, I like to, you know, uh, hear about other stuff. It's sometimes fun. Um, yeah. yeah I put, I in my, in my Twitter handle, I say I'm a non-toxic maximalish. I, I don't I don't shit on other people. Um, I, I think the community is just getting to a size where if you want to start making the circle sort of orders of magnitude bigger on, on who you're bringing into the circle, you're going to need to talk to, you know, normies and people who don't want to get yelled at because they're looking at things and they're reading articles. Um, and I'm just too old. You know, I don't have the energy of the, the maximalists who do listen that we, we owe them a a fair amount of gratitude to sort of protect the um, integrity of the community and the system and all that. Uh, I just, I don't, I don't have that in me. <laughs> I feel you. I haven't got time to be so mad as I, but I, yeah, you're, you're right. Like it's a, it's a, a job that sometimes needs to be done. Uh, I, what, something that you said, obviously you did crypto Mondays and then now you do Bitcoin based meetups. And I've been to quite a few crypto meetups and I've hosted a few Bitcoin meetups in my time. Um, and I, I noticed like quite a few differences between, the two, like the kind of people that are coming, the discussions that I had, like what are the kind of like, what would you say are the key differences that you find um, in the US between like the crypto based meetups and the Bitcoin specific kind of based meetups? Yeah, the, the crypto meetups were a little easier because every topic was a possible topic. I mean, just put any word in, for, in front of the word crypto and it could have been a topic. So, you know, these guys were making NFT concert buttons. You could have a regulation um you know update on re regulations every other month you could talk about investing in crypto um where that type of um that type of event they're they're actually sometimes really interesting they would often bring in 
investor types, lawyer types, and general technology types. Um, and it was more of like a room full of strangers, I think might be the best way to describe it, where Bitcoin meetups are much more like a community and Bitcoin may not even, you might not even get to the, the Bitcoin. You might get into like, um, you know, liber libertarianism, right? Or just other sort of concepts within the community that are either Bitcoin specific or Bitcoin ten tangential or just its own topic. Whether or not they're investors specifically or lawyers specifically, it, it seems like it's much more normal people. I, I don't know if that's the right way to describe it. That said, though, meetups can be a little harder because, especially with the slow pace that Bitcoin goes, you know, if you look at how many years it just took Taproot to get sort of thought through, signaled for, you know, and, and pushed through, like, well, shit, how many Taproot meetings are you going to have over five years? Um, I prefer the, I think, I think the crypto, the crypto meetups are fun for what they are, right? You're sort of looking into the future of what's possible, big question mark on if it's possible or not, right? I think a lot of Bitcoiners would say it's not. So it's just a bullshit, a bullshit meeting, um, but still sort of fun to look at things through, look at many different topics through, through this different lens where, where Bitcoin is much more like hanging out with your friends, I'd say. Yeah. yeah where, where, where are you, where are you located? Uh, me, uh, so I'm I'm located in the UK. Uh, it's like my home base. But then I just spent three months in Brazil, so I guess I'm not too good at being located here. Um, but yeah, so I've done like a few meetups in London, like co-hosted a few. Um, but since I left, it's now gone on and continued and grown without me, which is a good thing to be honest. Because I, I think I find like so I think when you said the crypto ones are more fun, like I've been to one crypto one that was really fun, but then I went to a quite a few that were just kind of. Just like, I, don't know, I feel like I, I kind of get jaded by it because it's just like, oh, I heard about this thing. And it's like, yeah, I don't give a shit. <laughs> like, it's just always like some random crap that like I don't care about. And then there's always like someone who's just got into crypto four months ago is telling me why like Ethereum is the best thing on earth. And I'm like, yeah, but like, it's not actually. And then it just, we I always go on these awkward things. Whereas with the Bitcoin ones, I find the ones where it gets really technical a bit like, I, not for me because like I like a bit of technical stuff don't get me wrong like I like to learn something new but then I find that like it can go on for like an hour of someone just lecturing at me and I'm like dude I, I, I struggle to go to any lectures at university let alone at a Bitcoin like meetup but I like the really casual ones where you can talk to someone one-on-one -on -one and like learn something you didn't you didn't know from a guy smarter than you or like talk about something else random and so I really like the casual Bitcoin meetups but I found like they're the ones where I've had the most fun and like learned about like more about Bitcoin and lightning and stuff like that as well um and there's things like you know like i i get like absolutely smashed and have like uh have like uh two hours of like getting completely wasted and talking about like vr games or something <laughs> like, yeah, like a big exactly. yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, the crypto events i think you or i are on the same page with the crypto events where there's a point at which you realize the next crypto event is no different than the one you went to three years ago it's just either a new company or a new the the new thing and when there are new people and it's the first time they've sort of heard these concepts it is very interesting to them. In, in, in 2017, I, I knew I could have told you what Gollum was, right? And, and I could have told you, you know, the top 100, let's just say, projects, I probably knew what they were. Where now, if you were to spit out a name, I'd be like, I don't know, is that a smart contract platform? I don't know. And so I have my friends who know I'm into Bitcoin. And, you know, they'll ask me crypto questions. And it's, it's not that I don't understand the premise. It's just, I don't care. You know, um, if there's a thousand projects, I bet 10 make it and really make it, whatever that means. But I'm not going to keep up with the 995 that don't these days. Um, and then on, on the Bitcoin side, and so in San Francisco right now, we, we have, well, what, what happened was <clears throat> prior to the pandemic, there was Socratic seminars, uh, San Francisco Bit Devs, and then there was Lightning Devs. So both those meetups are going on pretty regularly, and <clears throat> and uh, there was also, I mean, you can always find a crypto meetup. That that part's easy. Um, during the pandemic, everything just stopped, um, and then what happened with our group specifically? A handful of us were on a Telegram group um, and meeting meeting up at Ocean Beach, which is a shitty freezing cold beach in San Francisco where you wouldn't actually go swimming, but you drink beers there. Um, or there's a park uh, in, the, in the mission called Dolores Park. And we were getting together, just 
when, when we could and doing our six feet of spacing or whatever the hell we were doing. And then finally someone on um, Telegram, you know, almost in a frustrated way was like, can we just fucking get together? Like, can we just have a meetup? And then there's a bar in the city, Aces Bar. It's Bitcoin friendly. Um, and so we started, we started having meetups there. And, you know, 10, 10, 15 people were coming all the time. We were doing it once a week in the beginning. Um, and now, and now every other week. And right now that's one of the only Bitcoin events happening in the city. Socratic Seminars is, um, is about to pick back up, which is great. And there has been one, one lightning devs meeting, but, but right now that, that's the only thing we have going on. That is a casual, that's a casual version. So it's always, um, it's always sort of the one where we're having beers, talking about VR. What's great is the, the lineup of people, because I'm with you on the more technical ones. Like I love going to Socratic Seminar. I can kind of keep up in the beginning, but near the end, I don't know what these nerds are talking about. They are 10 times smarter than me on my work, on their worst day, you know, on their best day, they're a thousand times smarter than me. So by the end, me and my buddy, Tommy, we sit in the back, right? We just, we just sit in the back and we, we, we crack jokes and these guys are solving some complicated and nuanced problems in real time. The ones that we have at ACEs are fire because you have sort of three or four different types of people, right? You get people like me and Tommy, just normal people. We like Bitcoin, but we don't work in Bitcoin. We're decently knowledgeable. Then you got, let's say Casey. Casey's a lightning expert, an ex-frog. He is just a Bitcoin in general expert. Any technical question you have, they can answer over beers, right? Or over a shot of whiskey. And then, oh, in comes, you know, um, Amy, and she works at Kraken. And so you end up getting this real good mix of, um, or Connor works at Unchained. You get a real good mix of normies uh, and enthusiasts, fucking experts, and industry people. And so when the, when the, when the stars align on those meetups, they're better, I think, than, they're, they're better for sort of anyone to get any question they want answered than even a Socratic seminar, which, um, you know, is, is for me sometimes too smart smarty pants um in like 2017 i was also you know studying the top shitcoin projects and stuff like that and i also have kind of stopped keeping tabs on it so much um but san francisco is known as like a mecca for tech and stuff like that you're real close to silicon valley were there any crypto projects that kind of grew out of these meetings that you guys were organizing you know not the, the ones we were organizing it changed every week um it changed every week. There was a panel. It wasn't a get together. So we would have a panel um, and we're going to talk about, you know, stable coins. So, you know, we'll have um, Ample Forth and I can't remember the other ones there. So there were gen the people that we generally brought there were already doing something, right? We, they, they'd be in the front sort of answering questions. And then I, I can't say for sure one way or another. I didn't get the vibe. Um, I didn't get the vibe that there was that sort of community building, but just, I think because of the nature of our events, I, I'm sure that there were other events that maybe had hackathons or, you know, um, things like that, where maybe some projects did sort of pop out of the ether that way. The ether EM. You guys see what I did there? Boom. <laughs> yeah, I say, I, I, I kind of, I kind of heard it and wanted to laugh, but I thought I couldn't give you the, uh, the pleasure. <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah, I, I guess, um, yeah, it's interesting. Like what you say about the, the learning side of things as well. Like, uh, I think it just, yeah, I think for me, it's like, uh, yeah, definitely it's interesting stuff. And I think, don't get me wrong. Like I, it sounds like I'm kind of shitting on the, the smart lectures, but actually like when I went to, uh, the lightning summit in El Salvador, it was like one of the coolest things was going to the, like the room where people were kind of like building stuff oh like, somebody's somebody's dropping a humble rag oh no oh god i didn't mean to okay well, sorry i was in El Salvador. When, I, when, I, when i went to an unnamed conference uh, about bitcoin <laughs> um i can go and get the hat if you want um no when i went to an unnamed conference um i it was like the room where there were people were building stuff like showing off atm like the atms and blah 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 like and and then there was another room where like people were like, like the more technical talks like that was the bit i thought was the coolest bit of it 
But at the same time, I'm like, I know me and I know that I like sit there shaking my leg and then like get distracted and like, you know, I'm like an ADHD ridden child. So I know I'm just going to fail to pay attention for too long. But for like 10 minutes, I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And then I'm like, I've got to do the next exciting thing. And, you know, so it kind of ruins it. But, um, but yeah, so I'm not necessarily shitting on them. <laughs> the, the event, were you in Miami? Uh, no, I, were you there in Miami? I well, when so. I was in Miami, <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't end up going to... I didn't end up going to any of the talks, um, probably for similar reasons. That and I know they're going to be on YouTube, or there's going to be a version of those talks on a variety of podcasts. Where being able to like catch up with people I hadn't talked to in a while, both in terms of just friendliness or just you know, I know that this guy's a smart guy, and so I can just ask him that way. Um, you know, ultimately is is how I spent the whole time. So I I, I totally get it. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I, I definitely enjoyed that a lot as well. It was like meeting a lot of people we'd had on the podcast, meeting some like uh, people I knew from Brazil and things like that. It was really cool. And I think, um, yeah, I just think it's that's all around a good way. I, I, I think it's interesting with Miami this year. Like I, I wanted to go, but like obviously not enough to go. Um, but like I didn't, I think like last year I had like a lot of FOMO because it was like, I really wanted to go and like bloody, you know, El Salvador adopted legal tender and all this. I was like, wow, you know, um, so there's a lot of like exciting buzz. And this year, I don't know, there was a lot of like news that came out, but I don't know whether it's just me being, I don't know, like jaded about things or I don't know what it was, but I just didn't really have any fun. I like, I wanted to go, but I just didn't. And I didn't really care. <laughs> so I don't it's know. If... No, it's, it's you. It's you right. uh, not wanting to have FOMO. Oh, anyway, fair th enough. Th this year's, con th this year's conference was great. Um, the Good. year before the venue probably wasn't the best venue uh, for the amount of people they had this year they did it at the miami conference center right convention center so no problem it was built to hold that 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 many people um i do think there is a and this sort of goes back to what type of meetups make the most sense are the when we think about like the socratic seminars the lightning seminars the more technical ones they really cater to that the I don't call them the in crowd that's not the right word but like the core devs and, and the people who are them where my neighbor is never going to go to one of those things ever the 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 conference is is getting larger in that way where you're starting to get more and more of those people that aren't going to go to the technical stage right they actually do want to hear from Serena Williams or whatever you know uh, on those topics so we, one of the conversations where I think there were 30,000 people that went this year. What is the number of people where you just don't even consider going? You know, is it, it when, when that conference has 250,000 people, do we skip it? You know, I mean, because now, now it's Wall Street, it's, it's a normie conference. And it's going to get that way, though. It's not just going to stay at 30,000 awesome people. It's going to grow and grow and grow. True. And I guess then does like it become, then it's like, do you then start having conferences for like the Bitcoin transaction conference where it's talking about like transactions and how you can like, or like Bitcoin block explorer conference where you talk about, you know, like your passion for block explorers and things like that. Maybe, maybe it goes down that route. Um, I don't know. Um, my buddy worked in search marketing and he said it was the same trajectory of that, right? They had their conferences, they got bigger, 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 but then sort of the core guys felt that that was too big. So they split off and started a smaller one. And guess what happened? That one got bigger, 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 and then got bought by the big guy. So I, I, my hope for Bitcoin, but also fear is just the reality that that community that we sort of talked about, what's the difference between a crypto event and a Bitcoin event? And the answer is the community. That community can't sustain itself at scale. Not the way that Bitcoin can scale to every single person in one form or another. We're just waiting for either more infrastructure or more UX or more knowledge or education or more acceptance or more regulation, right? And it's just a, it's a waiting game and Bitcoin doesn't give a fuck, right? It'll wait a decade. It couldn't give a fuck of when people are ready. It'll, when people are ready, it'll, it'll be there. So, so Bitcoin can scale that way, but that sort of community, that's, that's my big, not fear, right? Cause I get it. That's what Bitcoin is born to do. But I, I don't know that I want to go to a 200 and a you know, quarter million people wearing Patagonia vests and khakis and, you know, just trying to figure out how we flip this on the New York stock, whatever. Yeah, I get you. It kind of like becomes, it starts to feel played out maybe, I suppose. And like, yeah, which, um, which it's going to, there's no other, it's going to be the hugest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I think I think you're right. I I I do. I love talking to meeting like Bitcoiners for sure. And uh, uh, but obviously, I you know I've got a shit on them too. So I guess I could say like when you're in Miami, like it, was it the only place? I feel like it's the only place in the world, the Bitcoin conference in Miami, where you could get advice on Bitcoin, monetary politics, and things. But also, you could get advice on your diet from a complete expert, um, and also advice. <laughs> No, you know, where, you know where I'm going with this. Um, no, I, I wish there was a Twitter filter where like, listen, yes, I believe that you are a technical wizard when it comes to decentralized consensus mechanisms. The fact that you only eat, you know, cow liver is interesting. I just, I just don't give a fuck. And I'm going to eat pasta and bread and I'm gonna eat my seed oils, fuck all y'all. You know what, sesame seed oil is delicious. And if if when I live to 95, you live to 100, good on you, you know? No, I, like, I like how, yeah, you've, you've got the, the right spirit there, I think. No, I, I get you, and I think like, um, yeah, I don't wanna to go too far down this road, but I, uh, yeah, I think it's like one of the things, like I love the the Bitcoin standard or whatever, right? But then like, uh, I kind of get fed up listening to safety and like shit on everything that isn't like specifically the way he likes it, like on every aspect of life. Or, or like, you know, I don't know, I think like, especially even the book, I feel like he kind of went a bit off the rails as well. Like, so I, I, I find that like, it'd be cool, wouldn't it? If you had like a filter on Twitter, like, okay, from these people, I only want to hear about like specific things, like monetary, like policy or like technical yeah. side of things. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think the whole ESG question is important to sort of work through. I think Bitcoin using a lot of energy is on purpose. Um, but that said, I don't think the person over here who says like, gosh, maybe we should try to burn less coal. I don't think they're an asshole. Right. And, and I, I have a hard time following, you know, especially when you can, you follow them on their podcast or you follow them on Twitter, like you, not like you know who they are, but you've been along for the ride long enough. You're like, well, hold on. When did you become an expert in that too? You know? Um, and just, and just hopefully we, we end up at some sort of balance at some point where uh, the vitriol is is sort of toned down right because amy over here who says like i don't know i'm just saying solar seems like a good thing right just shitting on her out of the gates probably isn't the best way to bring more people into the community as far as the esg thing goes you don't think that's kind of an attack on bitcoin because like the from my conversations with mining people they say that because Bitcoin incentivizes like renewable energy and capturing waste energy, it's actually super good for the environment because it incentivizes like the rollout of these cleaner types of energy. Whereas like this ESG thing to like, you know, like the change the code thing that they were doing with Greenpeace oh, so last yeah. week, like to me, that seems like they're trying to tame Bitcoin using like some kind of subterfuge. So in real life, I think that we need to be using way more power than way less. Right. If we just want to, if we're really serious about bringing certainly people in third world countries to some sort of a level of some sort of standard of living, it's going to require more power. If we want to just advance as a society in general, more and more and more power. So I'm a more power kind of person than a less power. I also believe that Bitcoin doesn't care if the power comes from a carbon base or a non carbon base, so not even like nuclear. I think people need to be leaning into nuclear faster rather than slower. And I do think that a lot of the talking points from, I'll call them the ESGers, is a bunch of bullshit that is a complete waste of time. So I'm on that page. And I guess ironically though, what I do see is now and then when I think people are just making, they're, they're not, right? They're not a political person trying to drive um, regulations or politics to achieve some sort of personal goal. It's just Ricardo on Twitter, <laughs> you know, saying like, hey, but doesn't it use, like, Ricardo is not a Bitcoiner. He's just, you know, graduated college a decade ago. He lives in Akron, Ohio. He reads, you know, Forbes, and he's just a normal person. And he says, yeah, but doesn't it use a ton of electricity for this magic internet money? Because he doesn't maybe know sort of the value of Bitcoin and the inherent value of Bitcoin and the importance of Bitcoin to the world. And then he just gets shit on, right? And immediately it's like, well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go over to these crypto guys because they didn't say that to me when I had a weird ass question. So there's just some areas of, I guess, maximalism that 
I just, I just worry as we start, like I said, as we start trying to make that circle, who are bringing into the circle bigger, it, 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 to, to have such strict um, messaging gets, it gets hard. It, it turns people off, even though I agree with them. Right. So a lot of times for me, it's no, nah, they're right. Like it does, it, it's using that electricity on purpose. Like that's a very key part of it. And, and in fact, you probably don't want proof of stake, right. For a whole variety of reasons. So the idea I'm there, just how some of these things get pushed out is a turnoff, right? I eat like I eat carbs and I don't feel like I'm an asshole because I, I eat sea oils, but I also don't bring it up when I'm around Bitcoiners because they're going to just shit all over it. Yeah, that's, that's fair. And I think, um, yeah, essentially, I, I feel like, um, uh, yeah, it's a double edged sword, isn't it? Like, I think I feel like some some maximalists probably put me off like uh, looking more into more and more into Bitcoin in my earlier time in, in crypto because I got involved in crypto first and then got into Bitcoin. Uh, I thought Bitcoin was like outdated dinosaur tech when I got into crypto, right? That's what I was told. Um, and then like just seeing people be absolute assholes just didn't exactly, you know, ingratiate me to the space um, or make me want to want to join the space, to be frank. Oh, should we? We'll edit this out. <laughs> no, nah, no worries. But yeah, like... Uh, uh, essentially like seeing people be complete assholes on twitter or like whatever i don't know clubhouse whatever it's going to be uh wasn't exactly it's basically it put me off at first quite frankly but then i can understand why people are like that because it probably gets pretty well it does get pretty annoying when like i have friends messaging me like oh hey man what about this like coin i heard about and it's like this, the, the eighty thousandth time you're like oh like <laughs> you know like I, I, just... I look at i look at the whole thing like a, a, a one of like a society video game right so in the beginning when you know certainly when bcash sort of was springing up and the block size wars were happening and these alternative alternative chains you know started coming into existence existence like um like monero like ethereum there was a group of people who are were staunchly committed to defending the ideas of bitcoin and that to me is like the army Right. When you first sort of start your village in the video game, you need like walls and defenses and everything along those lines to keep from being attacked, right? To survive the attacks. And so those are the maximalists. And without them, Bitcoin would not be where it is today. Full stop. Right. The amount of debt we owe maximalists is unrepayable. Um, for Bitcoin to be a decade old, or, or however many years it is now, but for, for Bitcoin to be a decade old, it could not have happened without them. Now, if you want to continue developing your society though, you can't just let the army walk around everywhere, right? You, you start building a church and a school and an art gallery, and you start sort of getting away from that pure military you know, idea. You still need them though. You still need them there for the attacks and um, to, to keep, to keep sort of the, the rules of engagement safe and, and pure. Um, but you do start adding, if you, if you want other people to move to what is now no longer your military fort, but your village, your city, et cetera, you need to have reasons why you're going to encourage artists to arrive. You're going to encourage students to arrive. You're gonna encourage people who wanna start business to arrive, right? And in order to do that, it means you have to find a balance between the military as a form of defense versus them just walking around telling everybody not to eat seed oils, right? So it's, 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 it's a balance that we, that we need to find over time. Uh, no, you're good, man. Like I get the yeah. point you're making. Like it's, um, yeah, you need a blend of different types of people, right? Like you need some people to kind of uh, put people in their place a little bit. And you also need people to kind of welcome in newbies and, and people who might make mistakes right. or or just might disagree with you um, and, and kind of uh, argue with them kindly. Like I, I find Max Kaiser extremely cringe and uh, personally, um, and and I also not a massive fan of Sailor or anyone like that. I just, I find them kind of, it's like I'm being talked down to, but lots of other people really enjoy their stuff and it's awesome because it brings them into the, to the world of Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, one of the problems we have, not problems, but opportunities, I don't know, for Bay Area Bitcoiners, you know, we, we're on Twitter and we're on Meetup, which is where a ton of Bitcoiners are. So that part's easy. But because we're a casual Meetup and because 
it's not like we're doing our part, but we want more normies to find out about Bitcoin and be able to ask questions. Because when you go, like when you look at any Forbes article about Bitcoin, it is wrong, right? It is, is not going to be right. Um, so, so how do they find out about these local meetups where they can just ask any question? How does a wallet work? Where do I even buy you know, Bitcoin? Can I buy a fraction of the Bitcoin? All those things. The answer is local meetups. The problem is my neighbor is just a regular guy. He's not on fucking Twitter at all. And he definitely isn't searching for meetups. And so trying to figure out how to get in front of the eyes of pure normies, um, that's been a real obstacle for us. We don't, you know, we don't know what the right way to do it is, but because we want, we want them to have a safe space where they can, where they can actually show up and, and say, hey, but what about proof of stake? And that way XFrog can say, oh, great question. Let me grab a beer. I'm going to walk you through why proof of work matters and proof of stake, you know, is a shit coin. Um, but that, that's what we struggle with pretty regularly now is how do we get more regular people who just want to learn into a safe space where they can, where they can learn. If you guys got any ideas, let me know. Um, well, I wanted to ask you I, to play devil's advocate a little bit. I kind of feel like Bitcoin's already been watered down like significantly from the original intention of like cypherpunk toppling the central banking system um like all these compromises that they've done with like aml kyc um you know and like chain analysis like stopping you know people from depositing coins that came from bisc onto an exchange even though you know they the person bought the coins in a way that maybe you know regulators don't like or whatever but the coins are coins like if bitcoin's fungible they should still be able to deposit them regardless of the prior owner and what they did with them um like to me it, it seems like there have been huge compromises and possibly way too many normies coming into Bitcoin and watering down like the whole objective of what it was for in the first place. Do you have any thoughts on that? It feels like a lot of the examples you gave were outside of Bitcoin, right? They're, they, the actual um, Bitcoin, the protocol and, and Bitcoin, the token, that's gone on chained, uh, unchanged. Um, you know, except for BIPs over the, over the years. And then governments and people are, are adding these things on the outside. I agree with you, but I don't see, because Bitcoin in some ways is a primitive, you know, and, and you, you do what you want with it and you can do a billion things. You can, you know, you can bank the unbanked. You can make it so people can escape, you know, you can just make it an investment tool. You can make it so it can send money value from point A to point B and sort of obfuscate um, the traditional, you know, the traditional systems, there's no avoiding the fact that more and more people are going to come in, you know? So I, I agree with you, but I think it's a positive, inevitable, um, reality. The, the, the going the full blast, right? So Bitcoin's like the one asset where the people who, who own it want it to collapse in price because we believe so much in the system and the protocol. Like when, when my friends are like, hey, why is Bitcoin at 60? Or why did Bitcoin go to 40? I have no fucking idea. I don't care about the price. It's gonna go way higher than this. I don't know if it's this year, five years, but, but way higher, I'm confident in that. Um, but the underlying technology, if I woke up tomorrow and Bitcoin was $5,000 of Bitcoin, first thing I would do is check, is it still producing blocks? If the answer to that question is yeah, I'm buying fucking Bitcoin right then and couldn't be more excited about the price. On the flip side of that is we talk about, you know, how high can Bitcoin go? I'm not an investor, so don't, don't write this down. This is not financial advice, everyone. Can I get to $100,000? Yeah, I think we all agree on that. That's a boring number. We're not gonna get out of bed for 100K. Can I get to 500K? I think so, right? Just under that is if, it, if Bitcoin could reach the market cap of gold, which I think most just normal people are like, okay, yeah, Bitcoin. It's, digital gold, right? It's gut value. I'm not totally sure why. There's not a lot of it. And I can't really spend it at 7-Eleven. It's fucking digital gold. That puts it, I think, in between like three hundred dollars and $400,000 of Bitcoin. Okay. So I can wrap my mind around that. Million dollar Bitcoin. This is where I start to have some real dilemmas. For Bitcoin to get to a million dollars, people are suffering around the world. Financial systems are collapsing in a variety of nation states. 
or war is causing a surge of demand for people who need these um, escape routes, right? So I can get my mind wrapped around how does it get to the price of gold? When you start going beyond that, you're getting into a world where like bad, bad things are happening that I don't know, right? When Bitcoiners talk about their citadel a lot, right? The, the, and this idea that inflation shits collapse around them, but there are these citadels now. That sounds like a horrible, horrible reality for a lot of people. So my, my hope is that it gets the price of gold and then we figure it out from there. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, yeah, yeah like, yeah, hyper Bitcoinization might not look super nice <laughs> it might be because of really shit reasons where like people have had their homes taken from them and like money taken from them all around the world it's possible right um and then it comes to that thing of like uh you're kind of creating a new world elite but it's bitcoiners instead of uh you know uh others um and is that going to be any better probably not like because usually once someone becomes elite uh their mindset changes uh, like a lot of people being assholes when they have a ton of money. Uh, not everyone's an asshole and they have a ton of money, but people who are is usually because of like when you get the ton of money, then you become more of an asshole. Like it's not always, you know, uh, like I'm sure like a lot of the presidents and prime ministers weren't born horrible people uh, or like, you know, uh, corrupt people, but then going through that system and gaining the power and having to change their morals to do so makes them those people. Yeah, no, they were nerds. They were nerds in your high school civics class, you know? And they just, when they graduated, they were like, I'm going to run for, uh, you know, city council. Exactly. So it's, it's kind of like, yeah, it will be interesting to see. Uh, but yeah, I think reaching gold would be, would be reasonable. Um, and you said, I mean, you said about like, getting new people to come along to the meetups, uh, free cake. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But um, having like free drinks always helps. I, I found like going onto Telegram groups was good because um, we'd get people in London where it's like, uh, like a cousin or a friend of like someone on a Bitcoin Telegram group had said like, oh, you, you wanted to learn about it, go to that meetup and like, they'll tell you about it kind of thing. So I had a few situations like that where like new people would come in through that. Um, and then yeah, on meetup as well, like people, the website, meetup website, people, you got a lot more people who were like newer to it or interested in like Bitcoin or crypto who'd come along. Yeah, me, meetup's been, meetup's been um, real strong for us. Um, yeah. I, I do still think there's that, you know, like my dad, if I said, check out meetup, he'd be like, I don't know what that is. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, I just, yeah. you know, especially in San Francisco, I mean, shit, you guys can probably see the wallets, but in the San Francisco Bay area, there has to be more wallets here than nearly anywhere in the world. Right. So I know there's Bitcoiners here. There's just crypto enthusiasts in general and um, technology enthusiasts in general. Um, so, you know, I just have to imagine there's, let's say there's 10,000 Bitcoiners. That number is probably low. Um, a thousand of which would, would go to a meetup. Okay, so there should be a hundred people, you know, at our, at our meetups, just, just statistically, you know, just because there's that many people who either know or hold or have heard about Bitcoin and want to get a beer on a Wednesday night. You mentioned the uh, pandemic kind of slowed the momentum down. Uh, have things pretty much like normalized in, in the city? Or, for, uh, for meetups are there still general. like, I mean, in general, like, are there still tons of restrictions everywhere or have, has it calmed down a little bit? Because that yeah, might also know, still sure. be having a lingering impact. For, for, for sure, San Francisco is better than sort of described uh, in the meetup, but, but again, but definitely stricter than, you know, Texas or, or, or Florida were. Right now, uh, you can go into any store, any restaurant you want, no, no vax, no mask. That's, that's pretty recent. Um, schools have, you know, no more masks. They did it a little longer for little kids. Um, just the idea being some of, some of them either had siblings or they couldn't have been back yet if, if their parents wanted to do that. But even that is now, listen, if you, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. That said, who knows? Any given second, you know, they, they definitely, there was a, hand, a while where they were pushing, what they were basically doing was pushing sort of the policing of this onto small business owners, right? So if you owned a bar, all of a sudden you were the person who was in charge of verifying somebody's health records and then assigning them to either sit outside because they're not allowed or sit inside, which, you know, I don't, I don't know that's the role of a, a small bar owner. Um, so that got a little weird. And I think you had just, you had a fair amount, you know, you had a fair amount of patrons and owners of small stores that just didn't not that they didn't care 
or have an opinion on vaccinations or COVID, but just felt like it was beyond the rights of the government to assign them this task. And it was certainly beyond their rights to know, you know the medical history of Lawrence. Um, but that hopefully is all behind us. Hopefully there's not another wave. And then now, you know, we, in San Francisco, there's a lot of social services. So I think we have more homeless people than others, um, which also led to, you know, I think th those social services sort of broke down or got worse, let's say, during the pandemic. Then you have a whole layer of, of low income, you know, restaurant workers, janitors, now they're laid off and, you know, some amount of those jobs just aren't coming back. I think you've seen sort of a, a pickup in crime um, because of all those things. But my guess is that if we look at any major city, it would be the same. Hopefully, listen, hopefully we're on the, we're on the upswing uh, of this shit, but not as dark as it's maybe been portrayed, but not, not amazing. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it still feels weird to me how like some places are, are literally still enforcing like masks. I think it's like Singapore you, at this moment in time, you can't talk on the train and you have to wear a mask because if you talk, you could be spread. And it's like in the UK, not like not there's nothing like it's like no, it's like nothing ever happened and then when i was in brazil it was like close to nothing ever happened um like there was masks like in ubers i think it was but that was kind of really it and then and when i was there and um so at the beginning it wasn't like that but when i when i left it was so i find it just feels so bizarre to me that like you know like one part of the world's decided it doesn't matter but the other just decided that it's like extremely serious i still find it very it just it's like hard to get your brain around it it's like it's, we all have the same scientific information so it's got to be political surely at this point like i can't imagine how it could be scientific if we all have the same information yet they're having drastically different approaches but anyway it's not a you know it's not a vaccine show but um but i get where you're coming from like i think i think the way things are enforced is messed up um and that's coming from a guy who has two of the vaxes back to the bitcoin conference um we saw the independent city of prospera um announced that they're going to adopt bitcoin as legal tender which is like an autonomous zone within honduras and then also in portugal there was an island that's a similar kind of autonomous zone um do you have any thoughts about uh these developments no um and probably not what you want to hear uh, when we're trying to get some content for the show but you know i think mexico also said they were going to um you know, put a bill you know put a bill through you know uh, i think we need some more countries uh, bigger than small islands. Um, I think the El Salvador experiment so far, tell you what, nothing hugely went wrong, which I think that's what the whole world was waiting for, right? For this thing to collapse. Uh, so, so far, so good there. It's a little weird as a Bitcoiner, where on one hand, it were, it's all about, let's say, uh, generally all about libertarian ideas, small government, sovereign, free people, and uh, Bukele is our Bitcoin hero and his tweets are fire. Uh, but then on the flip side, you kind of like you, you, you either ignore or, or sort of pretend to ignore, you know, article after article where he's either sort of stripping away the rights of the Supreme Court or he's taking like really, really draconian measures on gang violence, which it's interesting to see what Bitcoiners are willing to tolerate in the name of Bitcoin. Um, and I don't, I don't know where the line is. You know, it's, I don't necessarily love draconian measures, but I don't know, I'd probably hate gang violence more, right? Um, and you know, for a guy, the, the, when, when, when option A would have been to reinstate a local national currency that he could have controlled, right? He could control the monetary policy. He could have inflated it when he needed to, could have done all kinds of things and really consolidated power away from the dollar and, and just towards him in general, when instead he gave his people a device that no matter what he wants to do, he can't unwind that. He, he, he can say, he can turn off the internet, right? And the, you know, the satellites beaming down the chain or mesh, there, there's ways for these people to, to continue no matter what, no matter how draconian he chooses to be. So that's sort of a, an interesting, you know, opposite of, opposite of sides where, he does some things as a politician that I think a lot of people would have uh, hesitation if they knew it was going to happen ahead of time. But then on the flip side, you give people Bitcoin and, you know, that's freedom and you can't, you can't unwind that. That is, that is he's giving away a power that he can never take back. So it's, it's interesting to watch. 
I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see more countries like that dabble in Bitcoin, if not fully accept it. Um, I'd rather see that than situations like Russia, even though Russia's economy is probably far too big to be able to jump to Bitcoin. But I'd rather see, I'd rather see countries just moving towards it because it's a better monetary system than countries um, who just want to avoid sanctions. Uh, I'm not saying I'm pro or against sanctions, but I just think that that type of maneuvering will bring the ire of, of the United States government um, in a way that we as Bitcoiners just don't want to deal with. So the sort of the, the, the slow and steady rise from sort of underneath is probably our best, our best bet. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you about the slow and steady. I mean, when it comes to Madeira, it's it's about I think it's like quarter of a million people in Madeira or something around that. So it's like a it's more than prosper and it's like its own sort of, you know, uh well it's part, part it's like a portuguese island but yeah it's kind of its own running thing so it's, it's a little bit better than uh just like a insignificant city but um but yeah it definitely feels like we're moving slowly with the countries but that is potentially a good thing when it comes to el salvador as well i think that um what you said is is interesting because i think also uh, it's like a risky move but the upside is so much bigger for for um bukele doing it than like just getting his own currency because problem with his own currency is the economy is not really strong enough for a shit ton of debt and so he probably wasn't going to bring much investment into the country. But by going with Bitcoin, suddenly you've got external foreign investment like from businesses. You've got people wanting to migrate there that never did in the first place. So he's kind of like rebuilding his country by taking a ballsy move. So um, the upside is ginormous, I, uh, I figure, from that. Um, yeah, I'm with you. But yeah, it's, uh, and then you had, I think we had Shopify, wasn't it, as well? Uh, like Shopify and some other company or something, I think, are going to be doing Bitcoin. Well, that, yeah, the, I forget the list that Jack Mahler um, spit out, but a shit ton of companies that are now going to accept it. That And then, and then in El Salvador, right, it was um, Starbucks and McDonald's. And it's, it's almost like these large chains. I mean, when I say large, that they're, they're huge. That, in many ways, is probably even better than nation states, than small nation states. Right at the point where you know, similar like Fidelity. I mean, they've been mining Bitcoin for however many years. Um, they're in, and and to have a sort of a company like that, they're going to be able to navigate the regulations, and, and they're going to be or, or Coinbase going public. Right, all of those type of things. Like Coinbase is not going to get shut down. Like the United States government is very unlikely to shut down a public company at this point. Um, so. Things like that, I think, are probably better signs and better in the long run than even El Salvador um, sort of accepting it, right? The, the day that, like, if the day that Starbucks and McDonald's does the math on just how much they're paying in processor fees and how much it costs to sort of move their money internationally, if they can figure out a way where by, let's say, leveraging Strike, you know, or, or Open Node and just that's how you buy, right? So during the pandemic, we all sort of migrated over to this. Oh yeah, you just use the QR code. Well, if the QR code was just loading up your McDonald's app that was connected to Strike, and now it was all Bitcoin behind the scenes, on our side, it was dollars, right? Um, but behind the scenes, it was just that Bitcoin technology. And now their fees go from whatever it is, 3% to no percent. That I can see making sense real fast for a company that big, because that dollar amount adds up huge now, all of a sudden, they're willing to commit some amount of that money that they would save to lobbyists, to work with local governments, to work with national governments, right, to put forward their, their we're going to make money agenda. And with what little I know about history, the we want to make money agenda seems to do pretty well. Yeah, you're right. Normally, selfish interests uh, from big businesses seems to actually make things happen. It's a shame because I, I think Bitcoin, uh, there's a lot of power that can be had for small businesses, small businesses and communities to kind of fight back against bigger corporations. But at the end of the day, as you say, um, that's being a bit dream worldy, I suppose. Not you did you didn't say that, but that's my my opinion on it. I, I don't know if you guys saw, but in the UK, um, the uh, well, I think our Chancellor Rishi Sunak is his name. Um, came out and said he wanted the uk to be like a you know head of crypto development or whatever and like a crypto friendly country uh and so our royal mint is going to be releasing an nft <laughs> this is like a this is like a comedy sketch when i saw this i thought it was a joke right because i said he came out and said it and then like i saw this tweet i thought oh it's just a joke parody page it's not a joke parody page it was legit like he came out and said you know 
nothing to do with like taxes on like I, maybe that will come right but it was this whole thing like we're going to be like you know the best nation for cri crypto and businesses and all this stuff and it was like so the royal mint is releasing an nft um which that sounds uh, like the babylon b yeah it's uh well i just thought you know getting rug pulled by like uh the royal mint is uh, like the queen rug pulling you is probably going to be like the funniest thing that's happened this year if they manage to do the nft uh, I, mean, I don't, I don't, NFTs are hot right now. And people, listen, people flip sneakers, right? So what the fuck do I know? But with NFTs, because those are the questions that I get from my friends a lot right now. And what I don't understand, let, let's take, let's take digital art or digital things. Let, let's not use NFTs to represent like ownership of houses. That stuff makes me even more confused because Ricardo buys my car from me. And so, right, we update the blockchain and the NFT moves from me to him. And now you can all verify that he's the owner of it. But I just don't give him my fucking keys because the keys are in the real world and this shit is on a blockchain. And so now what, right? Like now what? So we're going to go to the DMV and someone, either the DMV or a lawyer is going to make a legal decision and either unwind it or, or, or they're going to have the ability to update the blockchain at which point you have a centralized authority who can update the fucking blockchain at which point well why decentralize it in the first place that's way too expensive with digital art let's just say it's uh, nba cards right larry bird larry bird gifts i'm in sounds great my kid will probably think it's amazing he'll have a digital you know, it's some sort of digital card book and you change the page and the shit changes. It'll be awesome. That part doesn't confuse me. The part that confuses me is why do we need thousands and thousands of nodes to, in a decentralized manner, verify the fact that my six-year-old owns this fucking card? Why not just let NBA run an Amazon, you know, SQL server on AWS? They can back it up once a week whatever they need to. That way it's super fast, super cheap. They can have a great UX. They can make changes when they want. Right? What, that's the part I can never explain to people or I can never have them explain to me. Why does the NBA NFT, why can't NBA one? Or, or for art, like Sotheby's. I would trust Sotheby's to let me know if Lawrence owns the piece of punk or if I own the piece of punk. Um, but I, I say that, meanwhile, I'm watching this shit go up in price and go up in uh, sort of popularity and the network effects. So fuck it. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about is what I start to realize. Like, you know, like I also don't know how to flip sneakers, but meanwhile, people are doing it. They've been doing it for years. And so fuck it. What do I know? I, I feel your pain, man. I bought an FT like, uh, I think it was like a couple of weeks back. So I was like, I've, I've been looking because I hate, I don't get it. So <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, I just didn't get it. So I was like, uh, I'm going to like try and get it. So I started talking to people I know and I was like, so why do I want this? And it was like, well, you can just like sell it for more. And I'm like, okay, uh, is there anything uh, else like, I can do or whatever? Like, I, why do I? And then like, there's this one that was like a game and you buy like a character. Or, I don't know. So I bought this <laughs> NFT, but it seems to have only gone down in price. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. Um, um, but I did it. So I'm now part of the gang. Um, I have one. Um, but yeah, I... Um, yeah, I wonder like the next thing really will be when when one coin NFT, right? Like because you know one coin is basically just a, a central uh, like Excel spreadsheet that um that there's just is like holds people's balances or whatever. Um, so yeah, one coin NFTs will probably be next. It sounds like exactly what you described with the NBA uh, database. But you're right, you're right. Like it's like uh, I remember it was like an Andreas Antonopoulos video that I first watched when I was like switching from crypto to Bitcoin in like early 2019 or something. And um, yeah, I remember him basically saying like, uh, if you can just replace like the word blockchain with like database and it still makes complete sense, then there's like literally no point in doing it. Like this is an absolute waste of time and it's just a bunch of crap basically. I mean, he didn't say and that. In fact, <laughs> that's the thing when you, when you hear, when you hear the concept that maybe some of these projects are trying to solve, you're like, no, that's a good idea. Like I, I see what you're saying. We should make, real estate transactions far uh, with much less friction i'm in i don't know why there's a token right i don't know what that has to do with anything or i don't know why you know wh why we need it on a decentralized ledger feels like we could have done this a more simple way that's where i always land where a lot of the ideas seem promising um and in good faith i think you know I, I, it feels like sort of that ico scamminess is is gone although it could just be that i don't pay attention anymore 
Um, but I, just, I always end up coming to the point of like, that sounds super cool, but so why is there a token? Or that sounds super cool, but so why is it decentralized? You know, and I don't think I don't think a lot of people understand. You know, if you're going to decentralize something, you're making a technical choice. It's a fine choice, right? And there's trade-offs. In the same way that I could put a security system for my house that was I covered my house in an iron dome and I dug a moat around the house, it would be highly secure. It would just be really hard to use my house, but it would be one of the most secure things ever. That trade-off for me isn't worth it. And so I, I don't I don't have an iron dome and a moat around my house. That's how I sort of describe not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> anymore. That's why I describe, especially to, to new people, like, hold on, do you understand like what you like why decentralized, you know, with Bitcoin, it's the key fucking point. Like it being decentralized is the thing that makes it relevant. You start looking at some of these other projects, you're like, well, hold on. What if the Bugs Bunny NFTs weren't decentralized. What if technically China could come in and like hijack the nation and get away with my Bugs Bunny NFT? Yeah, okay, fuck it, you know? Yeah, well, you brought up an interesting point with um, like McDonald's, for instance, realizing how much they could save in fees and allocating some of those savings to lobbying Congress or whatever. Um, do you think that Coin Center, I know they get a lot of... Uh, Bitcoiners poking fun at them, but Coin Center, it seems, it's like a lobby that is in the interest of crypto users. Uh, do you think that they're going to defend like private wallets and stuff? Like we just saw Europe say that you can no longer withdraw to a, a private wallet like on your phone without KYCing it first. Uh, to me, that kind of defeats the whole purpose to Bitcoin. Do you think that the U.S. having a lobby like Coin Center will be sufficient to protect Bitcoiners from? encroachments on the right side. I think that in many, many times an enemy of my enemy sort of situation is my friend. I think um, Coin Center is at least carrying the torch of education, even if that includes education on things like proof of stake. Um, I have seen, you know, some of the, uh, what do they call the uh, interviews? Well, the things that we see in Washington when they're, they're asking questions, uh, what the hell is that called? The commissions or whatever they have. Uh... I don't know. Somebody edit, figure that out and we can edit the word in. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, I always want those to be good, but then you see the people that are involved and then the questions that get asked, it, it really doesn't seem like they're trying to, to get to the truth. It seems like something else is going on. And so I think places like Coin Center have um, their jobs cut out for them. Meanwhile, there's other, um, I know that um, it might be called the American Standard. Uh, C.J. Wilson and Gary Leland and Amanda and um, Jimmy Song. They, they worked on a book. I wish I wish I knew what it was. I, I, I think my dad took it. Anyway, the book is to teach staffers in government about Bitcoin, right? So sort of starting at that low level, or if you can get these people to understand, they can help educate people above them. And then also there's another group that recently got kicked off, I think this year, called the SATS Center, and they are a Bitcoin-specific um, lobbyist group. So I'm happy that Coin Center exists, and I'm happy to see that more people are sort of joining the fight, and especially with a Bitcoin-specific slant. Go Bitcoin! Ooh, ooh. Yeah. I mean, we nailed it. Has this been the best interview you guys have ever done? I think, I mean, basically. Pretty damn good. Pretty it's got to be good. about 10 to 15 times better than any other interview we've ever done and ever will do, I think is fair I mean, to say. Right? I mean, for just a friend of Thomas, you guys must be like, holy fucking shit. How does he know this guy? Mind blown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got to <laughs> say, man, I got to say. An hour of recording. Let's get this down to 15 minutes and make you sound great. <laughs> it's just like you say like one word. It's like, hi there. My hello. I think Bitcoin very bad. Good. <laughs> just chop it up. Yeah. Well, we can do that for you if you want to hatch your job it. No, it's, um, it's been awesome to have you on, man. It's been great. Um, is there anything you want to like say I, anything I, about like where people can find like about Bay Bitcoin Meetup or anything about yourself you want to plug before you head out? Yeah. Uh, I mean, why not? So you can find me, I'm Billy MacDo on Twitter and Telegram and everything else. Um, you can find btcbitcoiners.com or bayareabitcoiners.com. Um, 
sorry, it's bayareabitcoiners.com is the website. And then online, we're BTC Bitcoiners on Twitter. Uh, so that's where you can find the meetup group. We have every other week in San Francisco. And then once a month, we do it in the North Bay, the East Bay, the Peninsula, the South Bay, and Santa Cruz. So people who are outside the city have, a, have something going on once a month. And then keep your eye out for a project that me and some friends are working on right now called btcmeetups.com. We're basically creating meetup for Bitcoin only. Um, every local meetup will have their own micro site uh, where they can have their events, they can have a blog about us, FAQs, and then all those events will fall into the main, the main site's landing page. So if you're traveling to Tampa, you can go to btcmeetups.com, go to events, search for Florida, is there anything going on in Tampa, and find, find local meetups that way. We're trying to encourage more, more local meetups um, just because we think they're important. So eyes peeled for that, you guys. Eyes peeled. I'll come back on the show when we launch it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like I, I wish we we said we'd asked more about it, but yeah, you can come back on for uh, round two. Ding, ding, ding. Like uh, whenever that comes out, that'd be cool. Um, and I, I, can, I, can, I hope that I become a regular guest <laughs> and people are like, who is he? We're like, I don't know. He's just fun to talk to. I don't even think he works in Bitcoin. <laughs> it's just like the, like the stig or something, you know, just coming in yeah, like exactly. a random, random special co-host. But yeah, no, of course, man, it was, it was, it was awesome having you on board. And yeah, it'd be cool to, to hear more about that once it's launched. Cause hopefully I can get some like uh, London based uh, meetups and England based meetups onto it as well, uh, which would be cool. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate you coming on and, and everyone who's listened, we appreciate you listening. Um, we hope you enjoyed uh, listening to us all talk uh, and we hope that you have a wonderful uh, day, month, week, month, year uh, and keep loving life, keep being awesome and most of all, keep buying Bitcoin. Take care. Cash, Bitcoin cash. Was this not a Bitcoin cash show? <laughs> Shit. Uh, <that'd> be a- <laughs>